Sure. Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to Women of Power and this session, Mastering Relationships When You Work Remotely. Yes. <laughs> We all know how the pandemic has really created a new normal for us and employee experience standards have really changed. How many of you have to communicate with people outside of your organization? Of course, it's just about everybody. And research says, if so, the most popular platforms are LinkedIn, Slack, and Microsoft Teams. You probably live on those platforms. But it's, it becomes really hard to communicate with your freelancers, with contractors, and with those suppliers, and sometimes it can become unproductive. So today, we have three experts here to help you manage your virtual workspace and help you build and maintain connections with your staff, your sponsors, in the era of LinkedIn, Slack, and Microsoft Teams. <laughs> so please welcome Dr. Sabrina Kizzy, digital media consultant and lecturer for Borough College. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yolanda DeGrange, Vice President, Strategic Relationships Management and Consulting for John Hancock. And Siobhan Gordon, Global Head of Diversity Infrastructure at Morgan Stanley. <laughs> so ladies, you got to help us out. What tools and requisite technology have you found to help you transition successfully and reinvent work? Let's start with you. Excellent question, excellent. First of all, let me just say, Hello, beautiful women of power. You look gorgeous. Give yourselves a yes. round of applause. You look fabulous. And so today we're going to talk about remote work. An excellent question in terms of tools and technologies utilized. I mean, of course, I use Slack, and I think we all have used Zoom and, and other technologies. But for me, as someone who teaches digital media, and just to give you my background, I am a full-time professor and faculty member at the City University of New York, and I teach digital media. I've been teaching social media for over a decade. And so I really try to teach my students how to use these different technologies so that they are learning it in school and they can also apply it in the workplace. So one tool that I really emphasize that my students use and everybody in the workplace is LinkedIn. And I cannot emphasize enough the power of LinkedIn. And I'll give you an example. First, in terms of higher ed, I'd just like you to know it's so critical that we are teaching LinkedIn in classrooms. I teach it in my classroom and in other universities. We give three hour workshops just on LinkedIn because we know how important it is because we know that 95% of recruiters are on LinkedIn. They are. And so it's so powerful that we're teaching it in the classroom and we're taking it a step further. One university, they actually pay for a photographer to get headshot photos for the students because they want to make sure that they're not putting their TikTok videos on their LinkedIn profiles, <laughs> that they have professional photos. But again, the power of LinkedIn, I use it for just utilizing it to showcase your talents, your strengths, your achievements. Sometimes you might be working remotely and you're not there on site. So how do you let people know about your achievements and what you're doing? And I utilize LinkedIn to let people know that this is what I'm doing. So I'm connecting with people on LinkedIn who are in my organization, outside of my organization, and I'm showcasing my talents and my achievements. And I'll give you an example of that. I was actually on site, just passing through in my organization, and two senior level people approached me at the elevator. Now, I rarely have any interaction with them. I don't go to the same meetings they go to, but they said, oh, Sabrina, great achievement. We saw what you did on LinkedIn. Kudos to you. 
would you like to be involved in our leadership initiative? And I said, absolutely. Wow. And that was not even me being in the same room with them. That was something based off of my information that I placed on LinkedIn. So I could talk about LinkedIn all day, <laughs> but I really highly recommend that everyone utilize that to showcase your work, your talents, your gifts, and it's not bragging. That's what the platform is for. Well, well Dr. Kizzy, we're definitely going to circle back with LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. I was talking with someone, and they asked me about my LinkedIn, and I said, don't look at it. Just don't look at it. <laughs> so we're, we're going to get back to that. But uh, Yolanda, can you talk a bit about the tools and the technology you have found uh, to help you? I absolutely can. So I will also say welcome to everyone at the Women of Power Conference. And a special shout out to everyone who is your first time here like mine. Yeah. <laughs> so one interesting thing in terms of just working remotely and utilizing technologies, right? So with the advent of COVID and the pandemic, it really thrust a lot of us in this environment where we had to work remotely. There was no user manual for those who had not worked remotely before, no etiquette, no information about nuances, things you should do and things you shouldn't do, right? If you are working on site and moved to remote, you just have to kind of figure it out. So I wanna spin the question a little bit and talk about working remotely with some platforms that most of us use. So like Microsoft Teams and also Zoom. So in us working remotely, a few things that are imperative to do, right? You wanna make sure that you turn that video on. When we start having these meetings, right? So it's already hard if you are working with um, team members or if you're working with clients when you're seeing them face to face, you automatically lose that connection when you can't sit down across the tape and lick someone in their eye and have that conversation with them and connect that way. So 100% you need to have that video on so you can have those conversations and really simulate that environment for them that you are there, that you are present, and that you're listening to them. And another thing with that is that um, as you're working with people, right, we send a lot of emails, we send a lot of written communication. And with that um, written communication, you don't really get to know people, right? You don't really get to kind of assume this personality the, and know the personality that they have. So you make assumptions about how they look, right? Um, how they speak. And how many times have you jumped on a Zoom or a Teams meeting with someone and you see them, you're like, that is not what I thought that they looked like, right? <laughs> we have these assumptions, right? Unconscious bias as well about what we think they should look like and how we think that they should act. But connecting with that individual um, on the screen, it really helps address all those concerns. And something else that I think is important is that um, at my organization, John Hancock, we speak a lot about showing your humanity, right? Letting someone know that you are a person just like them outside of your role, outside of your job, outside of your responsibility. I'm a woman, I'm a mother, I'm a friend, I'm a co-worker. So we really want to be able to show that humanity and especially if you're in an environment where you may have to work with a client or a team member that uh, may be a little difficult. I don't know if you guys have had that experience <laughs> before working with some people who may be challenging. When you start to have those connections virtually, face-to-face -face through the screen, it really just puts in perspective who they are. So I'll also share an example. So I had a very challenging client, have been working with for years, meeting with them face-to-face, -face, driving to their location mm -hmm. to have meetings. And when we transition to this remote environment and on team, so we're having a meeting, have my video on speaking to them, um, and she's just very tough. Okay, Yolanda, no, no. Yeah, 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 right? And then all of a sudden, um, her son scans across the screen naked. <laughs> Eight-year-old son runs naked, and she just flipped out, was very apologetic. But then I got to see her humanity, and from then she's been my best client. <laughs> very, very humble, very nice, because she had to have that experience with me that it's just not this angry client. I saw her humanity and she sees mine, and because of that, we're able to bridge that gap and build a connection. Thank you. <laughs> and Siobhan, you talk about some of the technology you found uh, helpful to transition successfully and reinvent work. 
Yeah, um, first of all, um, Yolanda, I, it's hard to follow the act of the, the naked kid <laughs> running across the street. I've heard of that with young kids, not so much older kids, right. so that's interesting. <laughs> uh, the other thing that I will acknowledge is, ladies, I recognize that this is a panel that's standing between the happy hours and the receptions and all the things <laughs> afterwards, so thank you for showing up. Hopefully you'll get a lot yeah. out of this. Um, in terms of tools, look, there are a lot. Um, and what I always say is use them all, right? Figure out what the platform is that works well for your clients, um, for your business partners, and for your team, and use all of them. Uh, but be consistent in telling them about the tool that you prefer to, to use, right? Um, I always say to my team, I use all the things. Uh, but if you really need to reach me, I'm going to say something controversial, call me. Right? Fine. You can still call people, you can still text people, and what you can say, which I think this is absolutely hilarious, but you can text somebody and say, hey, look at the Teams message I just sent you, <laughs> right? So use your one tool to help you get to another tool. Um, so I use all of them. We also have Skype, um, yeah. there's instant message, there's yeah. just so many, um, which can be a distraction. And so the other thing that I would encourage you to do is when you are in a meeting, maybe turn off those notifications so that you're not distracted by all of the different bubbles that are gonna be popping up on your computer. Yes. Another piece of advice, I'm so glad you said turn your camera on, because that is critical. I had drag out fights with both of my girls because when they were doing virtual school, nobody was turning their camera on, and I'm like, how is the teacher going to know who you are? Mm -hmm. Same applies at work. Be mindful of your background. Right, so I have had Zoom calls with people where their backgrounds are very distracting. I had one gentleman whose whole Zoom background was Dallas Cowboys, <laughs> which I'm like, I know I have some claps. Go ahead, Cowboys fans. <laughs> hey, look, I get it, Dallas Cowboys, we love them, but if you're on a call with somebody who likes the Skins or the Giants yes. or the Steelers, what are they gonna remember about you? That's the guy that likes the cowboys, right? And, and people already, unfortunately, judge us. And so being mindful of what you have in the background is super important. Zoom has tons of features now. So you mm -hmm. can blur your background. You can use your company background as well. I don't know if you ladies know, but Zoom can also give you eyebrows. <laughs> and... I did not know that. I yes. did not know that. Yes, so <laughs> Zoom can give you lipstick, it can give you eyebrows, so if you forgot to put your, I don't wanna hear that, I didn't put my makeup on, Zoom will do that for you, Yes. right? So leverage all of those features um, when you're communicating uh, remotely. And then the last thing I'll say is we have all of these tools. Don't discount the power of human connection, right? You still need to figure out ways for you to connect with people in person when that opportunity presents itself. So if you do get the opportunity to go into the office for a meeting, even if you're visiting for a personal trip and you have the opportunity to go in the office for a meeting, it is really nice to get to see somebody in real life because you'll think, oh, they're taller than I thought or they're shorter than I thought, but at least it gives you an opportunity for that human connection. And what we are learning at Morgan Stanley is our uh, employees are craving it, right? Because for two years, we didn't connect with anybody, right, other than who was in the four walls of your house. And so people are craving that connection. Um, and you do sometimes need that person to person, shaking hands. I've seen everybody hugging at this yes. event. Don't discount the importance of that in spite of all of the tools. Yes. Yes. You know, ladies, I want to circle back to something you're talking about with turning that camera on, off, people turning that camera off, being behind the camera. And it seems to me a lot of people are still in the experimental phase when it comes to using this technology and they're not comfortable with it. So as executives, as leaders, what strategies that you use to build connections with your team? Yeah. Um... You know, one of the things that I like to do is um, even if, like, so uh, a little bit of, about my team. Some of my team is actually in the room. I actually am technically remote. So I work out of Virginia. Um, there's probably some people in from Morgan Stanley who are like, really? Um, 
because I do look for opportunities to spend time in New York, which is where most of my team is located. Okay. We also have members of our team who are global. Um, and so even if the team is together in New York, we do spend our meetings on Zoom, right? So that nobody feels like they're at a disadvantage. Everybody is on Zoom. But the other thing that you can do is use those tools to create camaraderie, right? So International Women's Day, happy International Women's Day, everybody, was this week. And a member of my team put a post in the team's chat and said, hey, talk about the women in your life who've inspired you. So what you are essentially doing is creating that water cooler talk on those tools. So how do you do that? And what that also allows you to do is learn about your teams as humans, right? Are they moms? Are they fur baby moms? Um, who are the people that have motivated them in life? And, and it's easy, like you can just drop a topic in there and allow your team to collaborate. So creating a little bit of that water cooler chat mm -hmm. on the tools I think is really important as well. Um, and then just creating space for people, recognizing that you may have people in the room and people on Zoom, creating space and making sure everybody has the opportunity to express themselves. Um, I always say have a buddy in the room, right? And so if you are the only one on Zoom, you have somebody in that room where you can text them and say, hey, I have something to say. And then that way that person can say, hey, Siobhan wants to say something, and then you don't get lost. How are you creating those opportunities within your team as well so that everybody feels heard? Right. And I like to follow up on that point. Um, I have a dear friend who manages a large group remotely. And just to your point, she's really trying to find out how she can create genuine connections and that her, her staff feels engaged. So she has this form called My Favorite Things. And it's a form that she gives to existing employees and new teams, new people that come on the team. And on the form, it just says, My Favorite Things. It has your name on it. But what is your favorite color? You know, what restaurants do you like to go to? She asks different things of them because she wants to know how she can recognize them and acknowledge them. And one of the questions that I found that was so intriguing is at the bottom she says, how do you like to be recognized? Mm. Do you want to be recognized publicly, right. private, or it doesn't matter? Oh. And to me, that was just mind blowing because she's trying to tune in to see I want to show you that I appreciate you, but I want to respect you and how you want to be acknowledged. Because some people don't want to be acknowledged privately or publicly. publicly. They're like, you know what? If you call me and tell me I did a good job, then that's good with me. Some people want to you can let the whole team know. So I thought that that was so thoughtful because she's really letting her team know that she cares about them. And when a special event comes up, she goes to that form and she says, oh, this person likes this type of food, or this person likes this. And she knows how to acknowledge them and recognize them. Yeah, and, feel, and employees feel included and they feel like they exist. Exactly. So, wonderful. Are you want to touch on that? Sure, so I think um, one of the most important things is leading by example. So, um, I work with a team of eight, so if I know that it's important for a client or a coworker to see you, I have to have my camera on every time that I have a meeting. I have to be ready. And then if I'm working with an employee that may not have their camera on, right, or um, is kind of shying away for these type of meetings. It comes down to having that conversation. So I was in a situation where I had um, someone who just would never turn on their camera, they weren't interested. And I had to ha be candid to say, hey, this is the route that our organization is going and this is the reason why. Is there a reason why you don't want to um, be on screen? It was really because, hey, I'm working in this environment, I don't like my background. And something as simple as that, because they didn't understand that we have background effects. We have so many different things that we can do in order to mitigate that situation that they had. So it's like, okay, well, let's schedule a meeting and I'll show you how we can turn on these backgrounds. Or if you feel like you're not ready, let's have a prep meeting, right? So we wanna make sure that you're prepared whether you're having those conversations with your clients or whether you're gonna have a conversation with management. Um, this is a new environment for you. Let's take a 30-minute meeting to practice. 
give you your pitch, have your conversation the way that you want to have it, and then I'll give you some feedback to make sure that I'm coaching you to reach to the level that you want to be able to reach. So it's really all about setting the example and then following behind it. Now, um, so that's working with my team. If I'm working with a client, right, and maybe I'm on the screen with them and I'm in a room or in a Zoom room with uh, people who don't have their camera on, that's great for me, right? Because I don't necessarily want to be on camera. It's good to be on camera. So then I'll just say something like, oh, you know, I see everyone is off camera. I don't want to make you guys feel uncomfortable. So I'll turn my camera off too, right? <laughs> and then we just go from there. But it's really about um, within your team as well, no matter what you're doing, having the conversation, being open, communication, right? So at the end of the day, um, you are the brand of your organization. You are their best investment. You are their best product. So how you show up matters. The conversations that you have matter. So it's really about making sure that we are connecting and we're all in one agreement, especially within your organization, so that you can go out to your clients or to prospects in a way that's co cohesive and that makes sense for them. Very yeah. good. You know, there is something that people don't talk about, and it's probably something people experience here, and it's called proximity bias. And when there are people in the office, you may feel like they're getting preferential treatment, they get to be closer to the boss, here you are in a remote environment, you kind of feel like an outsider, I know somebody in here is hearing me. <laughs> and is experience in this. So can you talk a little bit about that? How do you help your team connect and those who are on the other side of that screen feel included? So that is a good question. Um, proximity bias is real. So I live in the Washington DC area and our corporate office is in Boston. So I've always been in that area. I've never been in the home office with my organization. Um, so it's about staying connected, right? So when there are opportunities to go to Boston, I make sure that I'm showing up. When there are opportunities when management is within our region or where we have sales coming in. So I think it's um, this week they're having March Madness. Um, so a lot of executives are flying and I don't know anything about March Madness, but I'm going to be there on Thursday <laughs> just learning about March Madness and I'm going to connect. So it's really about um, creating those opportunities when they don't exist for you. How do you make sure that you are um, in the place where you need to be? And then also um, from a team perspective, it's very important that you are um, having some regional meetings or some meetings where you're getting together and connecting in person. Um, it makes a world of difference when you're able to reach out and touch someone and being mm -hmm. able to be close to them, right? So um, with the effects of COVID, our world is changing the way that we work with clients and we work with our colleagues. And we know that this virtual environment is always going to be there. We have to be able to adapt to that, but we also cannot forget that it's important to have real life Yes. conversations and communications with people. So we have to be more intentional to go out and create those spaces for us, especially if you're working with a team, um, let upper management know. If you're not C-suite, have those conversations and let them know that it's important for your team to get together. Our companies have the budget, they can make it work for you to say, hey, we're going to schedule this meeting, even if it's, we're going to, our team has rented an Airbnb, had everyone come to the Airbnb, we bought our snacks, and we had our meetings there. You can find ways to make it work, but you have to be creative sometimes, especially if you're having some of that pushback um, from some of your leaders. And then from a client perspective, so I have some clients now who are saying, hey, Yolanda, we gave up our lease in DC. We are never going back to the office. We're going to be remote. I have some clients that are saying, um, okay, Yolanda, we're going back to the office, but we prefer virtual. We prefer Zoom. We prefer Teams, and that's the way we want to connect with you, which is great. I connect with them that way. But when I'm in the city, when I'm driving around, I'm stopping by the office. I'm dropping by cards. I'm dropping by breakfast or lunch, something so that they know who I am. I make sure that if there's time, hey, do you have five minutes so we can have a chat so they see me? so they know me outside of the screen. So it's really about being intentional and being there when you can be, but you have to create those opportunities when they don't exist. You sound like a great boss. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, 
Milana, that that was spot on. Yeah. This is also where it really becomes important that you are enabling other people to tell your story and know your work, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that when that proximity bias comes up, there's somebody in the room to call it out on your behalf. So your mentors and your sponsors who know your work and know what you're doing and can say, yeah, but, you know, yeah. Yolanda's doing all those great things too. Um, and so it's, it's really important that there's somebody else who can tell your story and know your work and sitting at those tables. And we heard about that this morning uh, when the lovely Carla Harris was talking. That's really important. Um, the other interesting thing to think about too is you're right, like we're all remote in some way, shape or form, right? Whether it be you're on a global team um, or Morgan Stanley, you're in different buildings, right? And so it can feel like you're remote. And so these are things, these tactics, these strategies are things that we're gonna have to lean on from now on, right? COVID kind of changed the game, which means we all have to get really comfortable telling our story and creating those advocates on our behalf mm -hmm. so that when that proximity bias comes up, somebody's there to call it out. And then it's on us as leaders to make sure that we call it out when we see it happening as well. Um, so somebody who's in diversity, you know, all of the biases, I think that is the one that people forget about the most. And ironically, it actually comes up a lot as well with people who are not remote, but also out on leave. You know, anybody who's ever taken maternity leave, right? Or any kind of leave, that, that's right. Like, oh, they're not here. Or, well, they only got a chance to work six months out of the year, so. And so what, right? Those six months, they were able to deliver results. So it's right. something that when we see it, we need to be prepared to call it out. Absolutely. Dr. Kizzy? Yes, and I would just add on, like, definitely be intentional. Um, making those connections is key. Um, I don't even know if we realize this, but this is the first time in history that we have four generations working in the workplace. And so the reason I say this is important is because our communication styles are different, our preferences are different, and we have to make room for how do we engage with, with other people? How do we make those connections? And just what was said earlier, having those sponsors, someone who's there that can advocate for us in the office and can say, you know what, I know that Sabrina Kizzy is working on X, Y, and Z, and making those connections just like you said. I'm always trying to go out of my way to make a phone call, meet you face to face, whatever I can do to just show up and be present because it is real in terms of that not having that connection. And studies really do show that sometimes there is this lack of, oh, I'm not getting the same resources because I'm not in the office. I'm not at the water cooler. I'm not having those discussions with my colleagues. I'm missing out on the jokes. You know, the fear of missing out syndrome, mm -hmm. that can be present in the workplace as well. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that we're intentional in how we make our connections and we show our work and our productivity within the workplace. Agreed. And, and let's just say, despite your best effort, you're doing everything that you can, you're still finding that an employee is struggling. They're not focused, they're lonely. What can you do? Yeah. Hmm. I think it's figuring out why, right? Like, what's, what's the reason for that? Right. Um, there are just some people who don't thrive in a remote environment. So ask the question of, can you actually put them in the office, hmm. right? I remember during the pandemic, um, everybody was singing the praises of, you know, wearing your sweatpants and your pajamas all day and wearing your, your slippers. And, you know, um, I know for me, it was nice to be able to exercise and then just run downstairs, right, and, and do work. But there were people who were really struggling because they were missing that connection. You know, those who are largely extroverted and get your energy from people and all of a sudden those people are not with you. Right, and so we actually um, created an opportunity where if people needed to come into the office, we allow them to come into the office. And so there's a little bit of diagnosis that has to happen. You know, what does this person need to be successful? And if it is time in the office, then how can you arrange that? Are they disengaged because they're in the wrong job? Mm -hmm. Right, this is where being a great manager comes into play because you really have to figure out what's happening with that employee. They may be in the wrong job. Um, maybe they don't have the right setup at home. And unfortunately, this was the case for a lot of people who looked like us during the pandemic. We did not have the ability to work from home, 
right? We didn't have offices, or maybe we were sharing small apartments with extended family. We didn't have reliable Wi-Fi. Um, and so maybe there's some stress happening there. It really requires us as leaders to understand our team and our employees as humans so that we can get to the root cause of why are they not productive at home? And then how do we create a strategy to address that, even if unfortunately that means saying, hey, maybe this isn't the right place for you, and let's figure out how we get your LinkedIn profile you know, set yes. up and get you into a different <laughs> job. Um, but being a caring leader, it requires us to do some of that due diligence to figure out the why. Absolutely. Shalon, you want to touch on it? I think she said I'm everything Yolanda. that you was going to say about that. Um, again, I think everything boils down to candid, open, honest communication, right? Understanding the why. So if you have an employee that was thriving prior to working remotely and all of a sudden they are no longer in this um, environment, they're no longer thriving, Def there's a disconnect there, right? Yes. And maybe it's that remote environment that created that. So having that conversation, finding out, do they need help with a setup? And they, they don't have an office, right? They don't even have a desk um, to be able to work and um, deliver on what they need to. So really kind of drilling down into those details to figure out, um, is it just an environmental change? And then if you're able to, I know um, some organizations have been in a situation where they've been able to now, if they're far away, right? So rent a little space so employees mm -hmm. can come together um, and have a meeting and go to, even if it's not every day, a couple of days a week so they're able to connect with people, especially those who may be extroverted and now they're in this environment where they're at home and they may be by themselves. But really um, diving deep into the reason as to why that change happened is going to be helpful. But then if you're in a situation where an employee was not delivering before and they're still not delivering now, it may be a, a job functionality issue where, it, yes. where you may have to have that conversation to say, okay, well, you're not meeting measurables, right? Maybe we need to look at a PIP. Maybe we need to look at a plan to help you get there. And if they're not getting there, um, let's have this conversation. What are the, these are the skills that I see that you have. What do you feel your skills are? And then maybe we need to look for opportunities that are more in alignment with that. If we find out that you're still struggling and not meeting measurables within this area, let's work together to find out how we can best use your skills in a way that's meaningful to you. Wonderful. Let's move on to a different question. Let's just say, what would you say are top three things leaders can do to create a good remote culture? Okay, I'll go first. All right. <laughs> so um, for the first one, again, if you're able to, I think that you absolutely, if it's once a year or biannually, you need to have a meeting on site where you're able to connect with your employees. Um, and then within that meeting, you definitely wanna talk about business, right? At the end of the day, we have numbers that we need to hit. We have measurables, we have goals, right? But let's discuss that, but then also let's work on team building, right? I know that many, many of you have been in probably team building activities before, and it really strengthens you when you know that you can play a game or have some kind of interaction with um, some member on your team. It really helps to build that bond. So focus on business, but focus on building relationships because at the end of the day, no matter what role you have, you're, you're a salesperson. You're a salesperson for your organization. You're a salesperson for your team, and we need to build relationships to continue to foster that. Do something fun, go out and engage with them. So one, um, having some kind of meeting in person. Um, can you go back to your question? Well, the <laughs> top three, three things to create a good remote culture. Good remote culture. So um, in-person meeting, number two, um, making sure, again, your employees have every resource that they need. Making sure that you have an open door policy if they are uh, missing something, they're having some kind of difficulty with their client or with um, some other colleagues. Having an open door policy that they can yes. come to you at any time to have that discussion. And then that the onus is on you, you have to be actionable, right? Because I know someone here probably work with a manager where you're sharing information and then they're not acting and you feel left out. 
-hmm. we don't want that experience to happen. So um, creating an environment where there's open communication, being actionable. And I think the last thing um, is just really um, setting the standard about the direction your organization is going, if you're going to stay remote or if you're going to be hybrid or even move back to the office, setting that standard, making sure that they understand what they need to do and then everything's communicated properly. Dr. Kizzy? Great question. So I would say first is always trying to manage expectations. I think when people have an understanding of what the expectation is with remote working, they know how to work with it. So for example, we talked a lot about having your cameras on. I have a manager where her position is that everyone's camera needs to be on, and she sets the tone from the very beginning. She says, if we were in the office, I would see you, and we would all be engaged. So she sets the tone. This is how we're going to do it. Everybody's going to have their cameras on, and this is how we're going to conduct the meeting. In the first five, ten minutes of the meeting, she's really doing like a check, you know, post check to see how's everybody doing. She's saying, you know, what's new? Anyone's kids graduating? She just wants to, in the beginning, set the guidelines, set the, set the expectations so you know what to expect. So every mo meeting moving forward, you know what to expect. The second thing is, I would also say having resources, having the employees have a way to have an outlet. I know um, someone in our workplace, they have what's called like a Slack water cooler where people can just check in and see how everyone is doing and connect with each other. People working remotely still need that engagement. You know, they say that productivity goes down when people don't feel connected. They don't feel like they have a say or they have a trusted person within the organization. So having those resources where you can have some type of virtual water cooler scenario so they can check in, that would be ideal. You know, Dr. Kizzy, I have so many more questions about LinkedIn that I want to ask you, but I really have to get to the Q&A and give everyone an opportunity to ask you all, our experts, some questions. So we could take a few questions. Uh, the microphone is over here on the side. Got it. Just go on up. And just please give your question and um, keep it brief. <laughs> Hi, my name's Henri Dawes. I'm the Senior Director for Learning and Development with the company called Achieve. Um, and when, of course, like everyone else, when COVID happened, cameras came on, rah, 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 I was the biggest torchbearer of cameras. Um, and most recently, within the past year, we had, we've had conversations about Zoom fatigue. And so we have sort of flipped that script and thought about it from a mental health perspective. Because if you really don't want that camera on at this meeting, is that the hill I want to die on? And so we've had, as an organization, a lot of conversations about that. Um, how have your, your organizations managed that? Yeah, um, Zoom fatigue is real. Um, and, and what I always encourage folks to do is if you do need to turn your camera off, turn your camera off. I think having your camera on when you are building a relationship for the first time is really important. Once you've established that relationship, turn it off and be vulnerable as a leader and say, look, I've been on 27 Zoom meetings today and I am tired. I'm actually going to take this call while I walk outside and get some fresh air. I encourage you to do the same. Mm -hmm. And that way, not only are you being honest about you and being vulnerable, but you're giving that person permission to do the same. Um, if they don't know you, then it is important for people to be able to see you. If it's a senior meeting, if everybody else has their camera on, then be mindful, and so maybe some of the meetings you have earlier in the day that are a little less important, maybe you're turning your camera off then. Yeah, that's a good question. Zoom fatigue is, re anybody? Yes. 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 Especially when it's deaf by 30 minute meetings, right? <laughs> and then at the end of the day, your kids have the nerve to come in and wanna talk, and I'm like, uh-uh. Yeah. Turn it around, <laughs> go back out, mama needs a minute, right? So. Yes, we'll take the next question. 
Awesome. Hello. My name is Tatiana Cadet. I have the pleasure of working in a DEI role at Publicist Group. And I appreciate all of you panelists for really talking through the experience of like extroverts really struggling during the pandemic. Um, my question is actually what advice would you have for introverts who actually thrived during the pandemic and they were in a position where they could finally be evaluated on their, on their performance rather than the cultural expectations of putting on a show and having cameras on and performing and so now struggling with the expectation of coming into a space where they don't thrive as well as others might. Thank you. <laughs> Can I ask a follow up question first? So um, I would then ask, what were you doing prior to the pandemic? How were you operating in your environments? Well, I think that prior to the pandemic, it was a struggle to be seen and be given opportunities because you're not always the one raising your hand or offering to do the things, right? Like you're that person in the shadow. Right, but when you're in a pandemic and everything is based on performance, what does the job get done, right? Like, are you completing your assignments? Like, those end up being a lot more important than the person who's at the water cooler having those conversations. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then, um, what I would say to someone um, in that situation is that um, it's awesome that you're getting your job done because at the end of the day, again, we want to meet our measurables, but there's so much outside of just I think someone mentioned today, putting your head down and doing the work, right? It's about networking, making sure that people know your name so that when they're having those conversations, they can say, this is someone we want to move forward. So if I'm working with someone who is an introvert and um, maybe they thrive more in the pandemic, so that goes to me having a conversation with them to say, it's not about personality, right? Extrovert versus introvert. It's about how can we put you in the best light to shine. It's about what resources do we need to make sure that you not only can do your work, but you're able to present your best self to everyone in a way. So even if it's a, a, um, an example of maybe you don't, you're scared or you're nervous to raise your hand, then I know that I can volunteer you to projects. Maybe it's a situation where you don't know the information. I can help provide those resources to you for you to start doing the work to, to get there. And again, I know I've said this before, communicate, communicate, communicate. When people know what your goals are, when they know what you're trying to aspire to, they're in a better position to help you get there. So if you know you're naturally introverted and you want to reach a certain goal, communicate with your manager. If your manager is not that person, you want to find that mentor, find that sponsor who's going to help you get there. But don't let um, what your personality is distract that because introverts can still be successful. They can still continue to excel. Um, and it's not really about the introvert, extrovert personality. Yeah. One more thing I'll say, and I know we got to get you another question. Protect your peace and protect your time. So if you are an introvert and you know you can't do eight hours of Zoom meetings with your camera on, put blocks in there so that you can get time to recover and then help people know what they can do to help you. Maybe you need an agenda so you have time to process and be prepared. So I'm gonna say it, demand what you need to be successful as an introvert, because chances are there's other people on your team who need the same thing. Very good. We'll take two more questions. Hi, my name is Corsica Gatherite. I'm with Travelers. I work in a business process management role. One, qu one question, my question is, what is one piece of advice uh, that you all can give for horizontal leadership in a remote environment? What do you mean by horizontal? Yeah. Like meaning that, like in in a project management role, there's mm. many different people. Everybody has a shared vision, but at the same time, everyone you know is responsible for their department. So I've been talking a lot, so I was going to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> no so horizontal? Do you mean like everybody's on the same? Yes, everybody is on the same, you're just influencing each other, so everybody is on the They same. don't report to you. They don't report to right. you, you don't right. report to them. Got it. Everybody working together. And how can you, um, 
What was your like question? Shine? So I, I was just saying, what is one um, piece of advice, advice that you yeah. all can give um, in a remote environment um, for that horizontal leadership? So that if I can. Go, do you want? Sure. So I will look at this in in two in two ways. First, I always try to be. If we're all on this, in the same department, in the same team, I always want to be that person that is the resource. So I want to always support my coworkers. I want to see everybody shine. And whatever I could do to uplift a coworker, I'm going to do so. So if we're on a remote um, situation and we're on a Zoom call and one of my coworkers says something and she's putting in a plug for something that she just did, I'm going to go and, and follow up and say, you know what? Sharon, absolutely. I think that's a great idea. I remember last month you and I worked on this project. I think that we should continue to support this. So in my opinion, it's, it's a two-fold situation. How I can really help my coworkers shine, us pat each other on the back, say dope presentation, and then also, too, what I can do to just really shine as well and, and showcase what I'm doing, because sometimes in a remote situation, people don't always see your hard work. You know, you're home, you're doing what you have to do, you're working early, you're working late, and sometimes people are not recognizing what you're doing. You're quick to answer those, you know, those emails and whatnot, but sometimes you have to maybe let, you know, people know your achievements. And you can do that in a way where it's not like it's boasting or you're, or you're trying to, you know, outshine, but just letting your supervisor know in an email. Like, this is what I'm doing. And one thing that I always recommend is when it's time to do your annual evaluation, I always come prepared with a list of the things that I did that year. Because my manager is busy, and I'm sure they don't always remember what Sabrina did six months ago. So when they're coming to me to do my evaluation, I'm coming to them saying, these are my accomplishments. This is what I did this year. So they'll say, oh, yeah, Sabrina, I forgot that you did that last year. So that's my advice. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Edwina Corpru, and I serve as chief um, COO and chief growth officer for a 100% black-owned women and uh, minority business based out of northern New Jersey. And here's my question slash statement. So I had the privilege before I took this role as I worked for an IT company and for 20 years, I managed, yes, I'm aging myself, I managed global teams anywhere from Vietnam to India to the US. And one of the things that was really became apparent to me was I had to build community. We were an IT shop, we had to be community. I don't think that community is something that we talk about enough in this new world of post-COVID. I know we talk about the tools, we talk about all the things that we've talked about today, but for us to evolve to the world that's never coming back, how do you as leaders see us building teams where it's really community driven and not so much individually driven? Mm -hmm. Yep. Excellent point. Excellent. I agree. I mean, I, I think I agree with you. Building community is so important. Hopefully you all are building community while you're here, mm -hmm. right? So the beauty of those tools is you can stay connected once you leave. And then you can also create that community virtually, right? I lead an organization called Caliber. We have member calls once a month where we have the opportunity to come together and build community. Not everybody can talk when we're on those calls, but you can drop stuff in the chat, you can talk. And then when you do have the opportunity to meet in person, it kind of reinforces that community. So look for ways that you can do that virtually. I have done things on Zoom with team that I never thought I would do. I've made guacamole, <laughs> I've made ice cream, I've listened to a live DJ where we all turned on our camera, if you wanted to, and danced or turned off your camera and listened. So all of the things that we assume you can only do in person, you can do it in Zoom as well. And that's a great way to build that community virtually. Yeah. All right, our last question. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, ladies. My name is Kiana. I am a culture coach at Great Place to Work. And um, my question is, um, we talked a lot about, or you all talked a lot about um, community to get everyone to connect. That's what we're talking, that's what the whole conversation is about. But how do you all connect them back to the mission when they're remote? Because this is the thing when we, we know from what we do that 
when people are not connected to and they look at it as just a job, like the people that are out there with two and three remote jobs, I ain't talking about none of y'all, but two or three, you know what, they're there. You know? <laughs> you know, they're not connected to one, you know? So it's like, how do you build the connection so that they're not feeling like it's just a job anymore, you know? Mm. I so, would, oh, go ahead. I'll just uh, be brief. So um, something with that is that um, every month, we have one-on-one -on -one meetings. So you're able to sp speak to management, speak to us directly. And that conversation starts off with, how are you doing? How are things going at home? Is there anything that you need? So first, we're going to connect on a personal level, right, to make sure that everything is good on that front. And then from there, we're talking about your measurables. Um, and then also, what are your goals? Where do you want to be next year? Where do you want to be next quarter? So every month that's documented. And if there are updates that need to be made to that, we're updating that information. Um, but it really starts with, I would say, management having that conversation with you. And if they're not, you bring the conversation to them. You set up the meeting with them to talk about your goals. You talk about your measurables and then where you want to go. Um, but it's really taking those steps to make those actions happen. Great. And I would just add the same thing, just trying to build those connections and those resources. And many of you have great organizations where you have employee resource groups. Really start to take advantage of those. I mean, they're there for you to help you, to assist you. You can build connections and, and, and really use that as a platform to identify mentors, sponsors, and get the resources that you need. So even though we work remotely, I know many organizations still have functioning employee resource groups that are there and present to really help you navigate through this remote workspace. Well, thank you so much, ladies. Thank you. One thing I can say is that this experience is expanding our capacity. We are developing skills, so that is a positive. And I just want to thank you to Dr. Sabrina Kizzy, Yolanda DeGrange, and Siobhan Gordon for joining us in this session. I hope that you found it useful. And if you want to speak with the ladies, we just ask that you step outside into the hallway so we can prepare for our next session. But thank you so much for joining us here today at Women of Power. And enjoy the rest of the summit.